Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to learn about two of the immutable sequence data types in Python, tuples and strings. We'll start with tuples here. So tuples are an immutable sequence data type that are commonly used to hold short collections of related data. Immutable just means after it is created, it can't be altered in any way. So if you want to change it, you can't do that. You actually have to create a whole new tuple if you want it to hold different values. So you might, for instance, use a tuple to store something like latitude and longitude data because they are related values that are not likely to change. Now, like lists, tuples can store objects of different types. So you could have integers, strings, or other different objects in them. And to construct a tuple, you use parentheses. So with a list, we used these square brackets. For a tuple, you use parentheses. So here we're going to create a new tuple called my tuple and set it equal to these comma separated values within parentheses. And then we're just going to print it. And similar to lists, you can also construct tuples using a tuple function. So here we're just going to take a list we'll create first. So square brackets, we're creating a list with four elements. But then we're going to use this tuple function to create a tuple out of the list. And then we're just going to print that. Now tuples generally support the same indexing operations that lists do. So all of those indexing operations we learned for lists will generally work for tuples as well. Um, if you missed the video on lists, I will leave a link to that in the description below. But essentially, to get values within a tuple, we can use square brackets after the tuple and then list the index of the value we want to get. So for instance, here we're saying another tuple, and then within the square brackets, two. This is saying we want to get the item at index two in this another tuple that we made and that was zero one so at index two was that was one and similarly you can do slicing operations so here we're going to get the values from index two to four non-inclusive of the four and some common functions you can use on lists also work on tuples so you can check the length with len min value max value and the sum of all the values and since tuples are immutable, you can't actually add or remove things from them. So certain list functions like append, which adds something to a list, that will not work with the tuple. So if you try to, for instance, append a value to it, you're going to get an error. And if you try to delete from a tuple, again, you're going to get an error because you cannot change them. Now we'll move on and talk a bit about strings. We did learn a little bit about strings in the lesson on basic data types, but strings are actually immutable sequences of text characters. So as sequences, they do support various indexing operations that we've used on lists and tuples so far. And like the other data structures, the string index starts at zero. So we can get individual letters out of a string by using indexing. So we'll just show how to do that here. We're going to create a new string called hello world. We're going to use indexing to get the letter at index position three here. So what is that? Zero, one, two, three. So that will be an L. We see the result there already. And again, we can also use slicing on strings. So here we're going to get all the letters from index three to the end. So low world. You can also use this slicing trick colon colon minus one to reverse something. So by using that, we can actually reverse the whole string. In addition, you can use the len function to get the length of a string. So that's just the total number of characters in a string. And you can count occurrences of letters using the dot count method of strings. So you can take a string here. We're using the my string that we already defined earlier dot count. And then you pass in the letter that you want to count. So here we're going to count how many times the letter L occurs in our string. So in our my string here that said hello world, L occurs three times. And as immutable objects, strings can't be altered. So anytime you're changing a string, it might seem like you're altering the string, but what's happening is you're actually creating a whole new string in memory when you do that. 
So for instance, if we use this function dot lower, that will turn a string into all lowercase. So for our hello world thing, all it's doing is making this first H that was uppercase be lowercase. But this is not the same string anymore. We didn't actually like alter this in place. This is a whole new string that had to be created. And just to go over some other string functions, there's a dot upper method for strings that will change all of the letters to uppercase. There is a dot title method that will change the letters to uppercase that appear after spaces. So here it's saying hello world and the first letters of both words are capitalized. You can search a string for a given character using dot find. So here we're doing my string dot find capital W and that will return the index where this value first appears. And if that letter doesn't appear in the string at all, it will return a minus one. In this case, a capital W isn't in our string. Now you might be asking, hey, we just printed out hello world and there was a capital W at this index position. Just above we had hello world here and we do see a capital W. So what gives, why did it say that doesn't exist in there? Well, when we call this string.title here, we're not actually changing my string because it's immutable. What we're doing is we're taking my string, altering it and creating a new string here that is different. But we never actually change the original string, my string. So when we go back and search the original string for that capital W, it didn't exist in there. So if we were to, for instance, go back and run the same my string dot find, but use lowercase w, that does exist in the original string. Now strings have a dot replace method that lets you replace a substring with a different substring. So here, if we do my string dot replace, we first pass in the substring we want to replace. We're going to replace world and then comma, you put in the substring you want to replace it with. So we'll put friend. So with this replacement, we're going to change hello world into hello friend. Now, if you want to split up a string into different parts, there are different ways to do that. The dot split function will fl split a, a string by where there are spaces. So if we wanted to split hello world into its two constituent words, we could use dot split to do that. So if we run that, we get back a list of each word in that string. So hello and world as two different words in this list. Now you can actually pass in different separators for split. The splitting on spaces is the default, but we could, for instance, in this argument, say we want to split on like underscores or something, because sometimes you'll run into things with underscores and you could split on a different character. Um, in this case, if we split on underscores, it doesn't do anything. We just get the whole string back because it didn't contain any underscores, but by default, it's going to be splitting on spaces. Now you can have strings that are spread out over multiple lines by using three quotation marks. So here we're creating a new string called multi-line string equals I am a multi-line string and we're surrounding it in three quotation marks. If you have a multi-line string, you can split those two by using dot split lines and that will split them along each different line that they contain. So in this case, we're going to end up with three different strings. I am a multi-line and a string in the resulting list here. You can use the dot strip method on strings to remove white space. So here we have a string with a bunch of white space before the actual text. And if we do dot strip on it, it just removes that from both sides. Similar to split strip, allows you to pass in other things to strip off. So by default, we're stripping off white space, but we could pass in something else. Like if you have a string like this with a bunch of X's around the actual message, you could do dot strip and pass in those X's and it will strip those off. You can join two strings together in a few different ways. The kind of quickest and hackiest way to do it is to just use the plus operator. So here we can say hello plus world, and that will combine those two strings into hello world. Another way to concatenate some strings together is to use this dot join list construction with just a space dot join. And within the join, you just pass in a list of the different strings you want to join together using this space as the separator. So here we're saying hello world 
join me and we're putting a space between all of them and creating a string out of it. So that is one way you can do it. Now the reason you don't really want to be getting in the habit of using plus for creating strings and concatenating them together is it can just start getting pretty cluttered looking once you get a lot of different things like for instance what if we wanted to make a sentence like this we had some variables name age city and we wanted to make a sentence out of that using pluses we'd end up with something like this my name is plus the variable name plus i am plus the age a string of the age and like this just is kind of difficult to look at and difficult to edit it does create uh, the desired sentence here my name is joe and i am 10 and i live in paris so we basically were able to create a string sentence inputting some variable values into it using some pluses but this is not the best way to go about this there are some ways to make formatted strings like this that are a bit nicer so we will look at a couple of those one way you can do it is using the format function. So what you want to do is create a template string like this. And in the spots where you want to enter information from a variable, you put in curly brackets. So instead of saying like explicitly saying name and string of age and the city, we can do this and say, we can essentially write out the whole string and in the places where we're entering variables, we just put curly braces. And then with that, we can say that template string dot format. And then for each one of the curly braces where we want data to enter from a variable, we just put in the, the variable where that data exists. So we're saying format this string and put in the name variable age variable and city variable where each of these um, curly braces are and it will just do that in order of... so when we run that it creates the same sentence as the one above it's just a nicer way of doing it and there is another way of doing this with formatted strings or f strings this is a somewhat newer feature of python as of 3.6 anyway but it's it's very similar to this but you can instead directly add variables into curly braces. So it might even end up being a little bit quicker and easier to use. To do the formatted string or f string version, you first put a lowercase f before the string quotations, and then you just write out the whole string you want, but wherever you want data from a variable to enter into the string, you wrap the name of that variable in curly braces. So here we're just saying, my name is, and then insert the variable name here. I am, insert the variable age here. And I live in, insert the variable city here. And this will again create the same result, but it's just a, a cleaner way of doing it that doesn't get confused with pluses everywhere. Now, tuples, strings, and lists appear everywhere in Python. So it's very important to have a good understanding of how they work, but one of the big drawbacks of all three of those data types is that they are sequential. So therefore, looking up items within them, if you don't have the index, is slow. You might need to look through every single object in a list to check whether the list contains it. So in the next lesson, we're going to learn about two non-sequential data types in Python, dictionaries and sets which can allow you to look up items much faster than you could with, say, a list. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.